In this lesson, we will discuss transpositions and the alternating group. We'll be talking about elements and subgroups of the symmetric group of degree n. So let's recall the definition. So this, the group Sn is called the symmetric group of degree n. We call it, this is the group of permutations of the integers one through n. And it forms a group under the operation of composition of functions. And we've proved things like the fact that there's n factorial elements of Sn. And we also saw that every element of Sn can be written as a product of disjoint cycles. Recall that two cycles are disjoint if they have no integers in common. Recall that disjoint cycles commute. You can switch the order of disjoint cycles. Moreover, this product of disjoint cycles is essentially unique. So we demonstrated that it's unique up to the order of the disjoint cycles. Since disjoint cycles commute, it doesn't matter which order the product is written. If we restrict our cycles to being disjoint, then there's essentially only one way to factor any permutation. But if we remove this condition that the cycles must be disjoint, then there's actually an infinite number of ways to write a product of any given permutation. So however, every element of Sn, so every permutation, can be written an infinite number of ways. Using non-disjoint cycles. So let me give you an example. Even in S3, if we have sigma equal to the cycle 1, 2, 3, I can actually write this as the product of the, the two cycles 1, 3 and 1, 2. So you can verify this. But I could continue. I could keep writing this as 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 2, 1, 3, and it actually, we can continue. This also equals 1, 2, 2, 3, and you could, you could keep coming up with more and more representations for the same cycle, 1, 2, and 3. But some things that we're going to talk about 
we've written the cycle one, two, three as products of two cycles. And another name for a two cycle is a transposition. So we'll see that we can actually write every element of SN as a product of transpositions, not necessarily disjoint transpositions. So recall a couple of definitions. A cycle of length n is called an n cycle when n is 2 we call a 2 cycle a transposition And so it's actually a fact that we can write every element of Sn as a product of transpositions. And as an example, let's look at a five cycle. One, two, three, four, five. And let's look at the following process, which we used in a previous example. But we can actually write this as the product one five times one four, one three, one two. And to verify this, we saw that in the original cycle, one gets mapped to two. So if we look at this, this product on the right, one gets sent to two, and then there's no other twos in this product, so that would be the output. If we input one, we would get output two. Now, if we input two, we see that two gets sent to one, and then if we, as we move to the left, one gets inputted to three, and then there's no other threes to the left in this product, so the output would be three. So if we input two, the output would be three. Now if we input three, three gets mapped to one, and then the transposition on the left maps one to four, and since there's no other fours, the output would be four. So if we input three, the output is four. Now if we input 4, similarly it gets mapped to 1, and then 1 is sent to 5 by the transposition on the left. So the output would be 5. And finally, if we input 5, it gets mapped to 1, and there's no other transpositions on the left, so therefore the output would be 1. So we get the same cycle, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The identity element of Sn is the permutation that would map every integer to itself. We can actually write the identity as the product of any transposition with itself. Recall that the order of any cycle is equal to the length of that cycle. So the transposition 1, 2 times 1, 2, those would be inverses of each other, so you would just get the identity. So we see that I can use this process of writing each cycle as a product of transpositions, and I can write the identity as a product of two transpositions. Since we can write every element of Sn as a product of disjoint cycles, and then we can write each cycle as a product of transpositions, therefore we have the fact. So let's give a just a quick proof, which I just stated. So any M cycle can be written as a product of transpositions in the following way. So if we have an M cycle, A1, A2, 
all the way up to AM. Just following the process we just showed, I can write this as A1 AM times A1 AM minus one, all the way down to A1 A3, and then finally A1 A2. So any M cycle can be written as a product of transpositions. We already showed that the identity can be written as a product of transpositions. And since every permutation in SN can be written as a product of cycles, we have the fact. So since every permutation in SN can be written as a product of cycles, We just write these each cycle as a product of transpositions, and we're done. So we can, in turn, write each cycle as a product of transpositions. So we see that every permutation in SN can be written as a product of transpositions. And we can actually do this an infinite number of ways, but we will see that, for example, the, the, the five cycle, one, two, three, four, five, we wrote it as a product of four transpositions. It turns out if you can write any cycle as a product of transpositions, the number of transpositions will always be either even or will always be odd. So for example, one, two, three, four, five, if you write that as a product of transpositions, you will always have to use an even number of transpositions. And this is what we'll prove. Let's look at a couple more examples. So we have this sigma is one, 12, eight, 10, four, and then a two cycle, two, 13, then 5, 11, 7, and finally transposition 6, 9. We can again just use this process that we demonstrated before on each cycle. So this, the first five cycle I can write as the product 1, 4, 1, 10, 1, 8, 1, 12, then 213 is already a transposition. I can write 5117 as the product 57, 511, and then the last two cycle, 6, 9. So we just apply the same operation, the same process to any cycle. If we can write a permutation as a product of disjoint cycles, then you can just break down each disjoint cycle as a product of transpositions. Now, if I have tau equal to this five cycle, one, two, three, four, five, we already showed that this can be written as the product one, five, one, four, one, three, one, two, but it's actually a fact that I can write tau also as the product five, four, five, two, two, one, two, five, two, three, one, three. So again, you can verify that these products are equivalent. But I want to point out that I've just written tau as a product of four transpositions and a product of six transpositions. So this is what I was talking about. Anytime you can write it as a product of transpositions, it's gonna to have to have the same parity as the other one. So they're either going to be always an even number of transpositions or always an odd number of transpositions. So let me just write up this observation, which will actually prove. 
So given any permutation of Sn, the number of transpositions in a product equaling sigma may vary but the number will either always be even or always be odd. In order to prove this statement, we're going to first prove the following lemma. So this lemma will show that if you can write the identity as a product of transpositions, it will always have to be an even number of transpositions. So again, let 1 represent the identity permutation of Sn. So if we can write 1 as a product of transposition, so I'm going to use tau1, tau2, all the way out to tau r. So if I can write the identity as a product of transpositions, so where each, each tau i is a transposition, then it will always have to be an even number of transpositions. So the final subscript R is even. I already demonstrated that I could write one as a product of two transpositions, but you could always write it as a product of two, four, six, or any other even number of transpositions. So let's begin a proof. Let's say the last transposition on the right, tau sub R, is the permutation with integers a, b in it. So suppose that tau sub r contains the integers a and b. Okay. So we're going to we're going to show a process where we can actually rewrite this product for one, but we're going to rewrite it with a in a transposition farther to the left. So this process depends on what elements are in tau sub r minus 1. But we can write these last two transpositions on the right tau r minus 1, tau r, in one of the following four ways. Okay. Well, if it so happens that tau r minus 1 is the same as tau r, then I can just replace the last two transpositions with the identity. So in other words, the last two transpositions would just cancel out because they're inverses of each other. Now if tau sub r minus 1 has a in the first position, like this, ac, and then tau r is ab, then this is equivalent to ab times bc. So these two products are the same. But look now at the product on the right where A has been moved to the left transposition. If the last two transpositions equal BC, AB, then I can replace this with the product AC, CB. And finally, if we have the product CD, AB, so in other words, the, 
the next to last transposition has no integers in common with AB, then these are disjoint, and so I can just commute them and write it as AB CD. So the last two transpositions can be rewritten with the product on the right, and we see that now A has been shifted one transposition farther to the left. So the idea is we can substitute one of these forms on the right and we will obtain a product of either r minus two transpositions in the first case if if the last two transpositions cancel out then we'll have a product with r minus two transpositions or still have a product of r transpositions that is still the identity but where the rightmost occurrence of A so the rightmost occurrence of the integer A is one transposition farther to the left So we're going to continue this process of moving the integer a farther to the left. So continue this process. Of moving a to the left. Until a is eventually has to be canceled out. So eventually A will have to be canceled out. And to see why, so if A isn't canceled, then A eventually will be moved all the way to the leftmost transposition. So A must be canceled, otherwise, we would have a product which still equals the identity in which the only occurrence of A is in the leftmost two cycle but if this happens then when you in input a number A it would get mapped to a different integer and it wouldn't be fixed by this product which is impossible if this product equals the identity so the product wouldn't fix A whereas the identity fixes every integer so whereas the identity 1 fixes 
A. So there's no way that the A could be all moved all the way to the leftmost two cycle and be the only occurrence of A. So it would have to be canceled eventually as you move this integer A to the left. So by doing this, each time we move A farther to the left, we saw there's two cases. Either you would remove two transpositions, they would cancel out, or you still have the same number of transpositions, but A is moved farther to the left. So the only outcome is you leave the number of transpositions the same, or you reduce it by two. So in each step, you're going to lose an even number of transpositions. So thus, we have a product without any A's. Consisting of R minus 2K, we don't know how many times we're going to reduce it by 2, but it, it would have to be R minus 2K transpositions for some, some non-negative integer K. Again, this is because as we move A farther to the left, you can take away two transpositions, or you would have the same number of transpositions. Now, we look at the rightmost transposition left, and we see that we can repeat this process with one of the elements of that rightmost transposition. So we can repeat this over and over. We can do this with the rest of the possible n minus 1 integers. So remember we had an arbitrary permutation in Sn. So there's a, at most n minus 1 different integers in this product. So we can continue this, remove all of the integers until all of the integers are gone. So we've canceled out all the integers. So we have a product of zero transpositions. Remember, the only way to get rid of a transposition using this process is if two canceled out. So the number of transpositions would be r minus two, let's say k prime now, and this would be equal to zero transpositions against for some integer k prime greater than or equal to zero. So this again is because when we use this process, we're taking away two transpositions at a time, possibly. But if r minus 2k prime equals zero, that tells us that r equals 2k prime for some integer k prime, and therefore r is even. So we've just shown that whenever you write the identity element as a product of transpositions, it must be a product of an even number of transpositions. Now we will prove the general statement. So the general statement is that given any permutation, the number of transpositions in its decomposition is either always even or always odd. If a permutation of Sn can be written as a product of an even 
number of transpositions. And similarly, the statement follows for odd number. So if you can write it as an even number of transpositions, then every decomposition of sigma into a product of transpositions has an even number of transpositions. And then similarly, the same statement for odd. We're going to show that any permutation can always be written as either an even number of transpositions or it's always going to be an odd number. So let's suppose we have two different products of sigma as a product of transpositions. So suppose sigma equals tau 1, tau 2, all the way out to tau r, and we can write sigma as the product of transpositions gamma 1, gamma 2, all the way to all the way out to gamma s. Where again the factors are all transpositions, so the tau i and gamma i are transpositions. Then since each transposition is its own inverse, we have the following. So we know that tau one, tau two, all the way out to tau r is equal to gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma s. And this is true if and only if by multiplying both sides of this equation on the right by the inverses of, of the taus, we have the identity equals gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma s times tau r inverse all the way down to tau 2 inverse and then tau 1 inverse. But as I said, each one of these transpositions is its own inverse. So this is true if and only if the identity equals gamma 1, gamma 2, all the way out to gamma s times tau r down to tau 2 times tau 1. So what I've just shown is that I can write 1, the identity, as a product of s plus r transpositions. So then the identity is the product of R plus S transpositions by the previous lemma you know that R plus S is even. Well, the only way that R plus S could be even is if R and S have the same parity. So therefore, R and S are either both even or both odd.
So any permutation that's written as a product of transpositions, the number of transpositions will always either be even or always be odd. So this leads to the following definitions of even and odd permutations. So a permutation in SN is odd if it can be written as a product of an odd number of transpositions. Similarly, the following definition, a permutation of SN is called even if it can be written as a product of an even number of transpositions. Now I'll define a function called the sine function. The sine function, which I'm going to denote by symbol epsilon. This function is a function on the set SN of permutations and it maps to the set of integers plus and minus one. And we want to think of this as a cyclic group of order two under multiplication. So there's a group of order two under multiplication. This function is the mapping defined by epsilon of sigma. So you take an element of SN this will equal one if sigma is even, an even permutation, and it will equal negative one if sigma is an odd permutation. So the next theorem we'll show is that this mapping, this sine function, is actually a homomorphism. So it's a homomorphism that maps every even permutation to the number one, and it maps every odd permutation to the number negative one. So the sine function epsilon is a homomorphism. So this is really just a simple proof by cases Let sigma and tau be elements of Sn. Case one, if sigma and tau are both even, then I can write sigma as an even number of transpositions and I can write tau as an even number of transpositions and therefore the product sigma tau will be a product of an even number of transpositions. So sigma tau is even and we see that epsilon of sigma tau will therefore equal one, but that's the same as one times one, which is equal to epsilon of sigma times epsilon of tau. So the second case, let's assume that sigma and tau are both odd. Well then the product sigma tau is even, because an odd number plus an odd number is even. So we have an even number of transpositions in the product of sigma tau. So epsilon of sigma tau will equal one, but that equals negative one times negative one, which is epsilon of sigma times epsilon of tau. Case three and four are really the same. What if sigma 
was even and tau was odd. So if we have one of them is even and one of them is odd, then sigma tau would have an odd number of transpositions in its product. So sigma tau is odd and epsilon of sigma tau would equal negative one, but I can write this as one times negative one, and that would equal epsilon of sigma times epsilon of tau. And finally, the case four, sigma odd tau even, this is similar to case three. Thus, epsilon of sigma tau equals epsilon of sigma times epsilon of tau for all permutations sigma and tau in Sn. And therefore, epsilon, the sine function, is a homomorphism. So now we know that the kernel of this homomorphism is a normal subgroup of Sn. So we see that under this homomorphism, every even permutation gets mapped to the identity one. So therefore the set of all even permutations is a subgroup, and this is actually called the alternating group. So let's make a definition. The set of all even permutations of Sn is called the alternating group. of degree n and is denoted by capital A sub n. So the set of even permutations of Sn is called the alternating group. And as the name suggests, this is actually a group. So the following theorem establishes this. Not only is the alternating group a subgroup of Sn, it's actually a normal subgroup. So the alternating group is a normal subgroup of Sn. And it turns out that exactly half of the permutations of Sn are even. So the order of the alternating group is the order of Sn, which is n factorial, divided by two. So this tells us that exactly half of the permutations of Sn are even, and therefore half of the permutations of Sn are odd. Well, for the proof, we see that the set of even permutations is equal to the kernel of the sine homomorphism. Well, we've proved that any kernel of a homomorphism is a normal subgroup. So this An is a normal subgroup of Sn. But by the first isomorphism theorem, we know that Sn mod the kernel An would be isomorphic to the image of the homomorphism. So that's epsilon of Sn. But 
the image of epsilon is the whole group plus or minus one. So we see that the order of Sn divided by the order of the alternating group is equal to the index of a n in s n and this is equal to the number of left cosets so the size of s n mod a n and since s n mod a n is isomorphic to the group with two elements then they have the same size so it's the same as the order of the group containing plus or minus one and so that equals two so see there's exactly two left cosets of a n and s n by using this formula, we see that the order of a n must equal the order of s n divided by 2, which equals n factorial over 2. So not only is the alternating group a subgroup of s n, it's actually a normal subgroup, and it's exactly half the size of s n. Now we'll finish with a couple of facts about elements of Sn. First, an M cycle is odd if and only if the length M is even. So this follows from the operation that we first showed to show how to write a, a cycle as a product of transpositions. So for a quick proof, we saw how an M cycle can be written as a product of M minus one transpositions. So in order for m minus one to be odd, m would have to be even, and vice versa. So an m cycle is even if and only if m is odd. The next fact follows from this first fact. If you have an, a permutation s n that is odd, this is true if and only if the number of cycles of even length in its cycle decomposition is odd. So for a given permutation of Sn, if you write it as a product of cycles, in this case it could be the product of disjoint cycles, then the number of cycles that have an even length must be odd in order for the permutation sigma to be odd. Suppose you write sigma as a product of cycles alpha 1, alpha 2, all the way out to alpha k. where each alpha is a cycle. Then epsilon of sigma would equal epsilon of alpha one times epsilon of alpha two, all the way out to the product of epsilon, epsilon of alpha k. So again, if sigma was odd, then epsilon of sigma would equal negative one. So the only way this product of epsilon alphas could equal negative one is if and only if an odd number of factors epsilon alpha i equal negative one. Well, an odd number of factors equal negative one if and only if an odd number 
of the cycles alpha i are odd. Well, from the previous fact, this is true if and only if an odd number of the cycles have even length. 